Can someone finally put together a simple storytelling framework for salespeople? I think you're gonna find one today. My name's Jeff Bajoric, and my career in sales has been a hell of a ride. And I wanna bring you along with me. If you prefer to sell things at a premium, if you never wanna win a deal on price, rethink the way you sell. Welcome back to the show. My name's Jeff Bajoric. I'm your host, and I'm here to help you rethink the way you sell. We hear a lot about storytelling as salespeople. I actually have an old friend who was the first person I remember saying this to me. And he said, Jeff, we're salespeople. We are professional storytellers. So shout out to Brock from all those years ago. But you hear a lot about storytelling. You hear a lot of complicated frameworks. You hear about the archetypes and the hero's journey. You hear about, you know, Donald Miller's got his story brand uh, formula that is going gangbusters. Everybody and their brother, it seems, is a story brand consultant. And that stuff really works. But I can tell you that until I had this conversation with Ravi Rajani, I didn't have a clear framework for how to tell my own story in a way that was succinct enough to one, feel impactful, and two, feel like I could keep track of it all. I mean, so much of what we do as salespeople is creating context, and we do that through story. And I'm going to talk about that next week on the episode as I dig a little further into my own thoughts on storytelling. But you know, so many of these frameworks require so much context that you can't just deliver it on a dime. You can't just tell people what it is you do, how you help, and who you help. And when I had this conversation with Ravi, and speaking of someone who's just, you know, been working like crazy to become an overnight success, we need to talk about Ravi because he just showed up everywhere in my LinkedIn feed probably six, seven months ago. And I thought, I got to talk to this guy because this guy is just doing it right right now. And when I sat down with him, this was the first time we'd connected outside of, you know, messaging through LinkedIn. Uh, he blew me away with his prowess and his understanding and his ability to communicate the power of story in such a succinct way. So you're going to love this conversation. Dig in and I'll see you on the other side. Ravi, thanks for being with me. It's really good to connect. You are actually, I think you might be, the, you're certainly the first podcast guest on this show where like the first time we're talking is literally 10 minutes ago when you logged in. And it's just really great to finally meet you in real time. I know we've traded some messages on LinkedIn, but I'm really a fan of your energy. I'm really a fan of your personality. And I mean, you're just so dynamic on camera. You've got, you've got that, that spark that I think is a lot more rare than people realize. So thanks for joining me today. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. And what's funny was for those listening, we didn't start our conversation talking about sales, storytelling, anything. I was like, yo, dude, you've got Yoda. You've got a Lego <laughs> version of Yoda behind you. And Jeff was like, man, that took me four and a half hours to do. And I was like, that's crazy. So, hey, man, it's great to be around your energy. And thanks for the kind words, bro. Oh, you're welcome. I mean, and for anybody listening, this is just to re- remind you that it's all glitz and glamour in the consulting and coaching game. It's there, There's no idle time watching football on a Sunday playing Legos or anything else. No, no pandemic projects for us. It's all business, 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 right? But uh, Ravi, what, how did you get started in sales? Because you did not start professionally in sales. You started somewhere else and then you moved around. Give me a little bit of an indicator as to why you got into sales, who convinced you, you know, twisted your arm and, and convinced you that you could do it. And, and what was that all like? Yeah, brother. Well, I mean, yeah, I didn't get my start popping out the womb and say, Hey, I want to be in sales. <laughs> or I want to be a storyteller and a speaker. That definitely didn't happen, man. But what did happen was my mom literally shoved me into the same dark school as my little sister when I was about eight or nine years old. And Jeff, I remember on the surface, I was fuming because I was like, hold up, I'm the only dude in dance school in my entire school. What happens if this dirty little secret gets out Ooh. to everybody? And it did, by the for way, sure. but that's another story for another day. <laughs> but internally, man, I was like, wow, I've never felt 
more alive in my entire life. It felt incredible. But eventually my mum did let me quit. And I stumbled into theatre as a teen, Jeff. I had no idea mm. that my best friend's dad was a playwright. So one play led to another. And then growing up, everyone was always saying, hey, man, are you going to take this whole speaking, presenting or acting thing seriously? Because we think you're pretty good at it, man. And I was like, no, <laughs> like my <laughs> ego was like, you need to make some money. And yeah. all I wanted to do, Jeff, was I wanted to work in sales and I wanted to do it on the trading floor. I wanted to do it in the world of investment banking. So okay. I did the whole business school thing. I probably watched the movie Wall Street one too many times back then. And I ended up on the trading floor at Citibank after I finished my master's. Now, what ended up happening was when I joined that world, I felt like I had everything that i had ever wanted on paper but when i got there i was like ah is this it mm. i was like is this it man and i started to feel over time that i was living somebody else's dream man i felt out of alignment and i made friends for life had an amazing experience but i was like man it's time for me to go out there and do my own thing so in august 2016 jeff i pressed eject and i entered the world of building out sales teams in early stage tech companies i was dabbling in the world of coaching consulting i had a few tv appearances with a personal brand around personal finance i was doing at the time i was truly what you would say at that time i had a portfolio career sure and then it got to a point where i was like hold up why is it that every sales presentation that I listened to lacks personality? It was like it was illegal to be who you truly were Ooh. when you wear a suit and you're in the professional world. I was like, that's a big problem. The second thing was every sales presentation or presentation starts this way, Jeff. Hello, my name is my name is Jamie and I've been at Cisco for the past. <laughs> like no one cares, right? Like no one cares. So the truth is, I was like, they're so predictable. And then the final thing I realized, man, I was like, there is little to no storytelling in any of these presentations. And I realized there was a big problem to be solved here, which leads me to what I do now as a speaker and consultant, which is helping the listeners, people just like you, sell more through storytelling. Tell me more about storytelling, because I think that is... Um... I 100% agree, agree with you. I want to be clear on that to, to go forward. But what does storytelling mean to you? Because to the average person listening right now, storytelling is not a framework that they're comfortable with. Because when you think about stories, you think about nursery rhymes, you think about jokes, or you think about your buddy telling you, you know, retelling the tale from a golf course or a fishing trip or something like that. And it's just like, how do I put a story? Like, it feels like I have to cut and paste something in that isn't necessarily aligned with the flow. And I, you know, so how do you inject more storytelling into a, a presentation? Cause they shouldn't be canned, but I guess what, what does storytelling mean to you? Let's start there. See where it goes. Yeah, man. And it's funny, regardless of what course I'm teaching, I'm going to be talking about this exact thing in the first step of my upcoming six week story selling bootcamp. It's the same mm. thing. I say at the beginning always. And it's about understanding what storytelling is in a sales context, because this isn't Hollywood. This isn't stories around the campfire, right? This is right. stories which ultimately get your prospects uh, into a mindset where you motivate them and inspire them to take action. But this isn't about this one time. Like, it's not like a TEDx, right? It's yeah, not this right. big idea, right? It's conversational, but it's about embedding stories in a way that's authentic into your sales process. But let's take it back to the fundamentals of what a story is and what a story isn't in a sales context. Now, if I speak to many sales leaders, they say, oh, Rav, we're already sharing stories. And I say, dope, let's, let's take a look at them. And they normally show me case studies or they show me a mission statement or they show me a marketing message. Now, they are all, narratives in some way, but they're not necessarily a story. So right. after reading many books on storytelling in the sales space and doing my own research and training people, I boiled it down to something called the acorn checklist, which is ultimately what I believe are the key ingredients for any sales story. Now, for those of you listening or watching this right now on YouTube, you might be thinking this guy, he's on crack. What is he talking about acorns for? Well, <laughs> hold up. Okay. So this dude called Ralph Emerson once said that the creation of a thousand trees 
is in one acorn. And I believe that the creation of a thousand relationships is in one story. Was it in a thousand forests or a thousand trees? I can't remember, but I digress. So acorn is a acronym and A stands for attention grabbing. So you've got to make sure that you have an effective hook inside of your story, okay? Now, here's why. You know, during, I can't remember when it was, but it was just before my wedding, I was ultimately going to the gym every single day, Jeff, right? I was like, I'm gonna be in the best shape of my life, man. I wanna look great on this day. So it was, a, it was a weekend and my wife and I, she was like, what are you doing today? I was like, I'm gonna go to the gym. She's like, well, why don't we go to the spa and you go to the gym and then we can hang out in the pool after, afterwards. I said, cool, let's do it. We jump in the car, my phone dies from battery, Jeff, a lack of battery. And I would never been to this place before, man. So I'm up against the steering wheel like this. Why? Right. Because I had to pay attention because the journey was unpredictable. Now compare that to the journey that I do was doing at the time rather to the gym every single day at 7 a.m. at the same time, mm -hmm. predictable. I didn't even know how I got there sometimes, man, because right. it was the exact same journey. So with your storytelling, how is your story taking your prospect through an unpredictable journey? And it starts with being attention grabbing. Now, mm -hmm. let's look at C in the ACORN checklist. C stands for containing a relatable main character. Man, I can't tell you how many times where I did this in the startup world where I shared an enterprise level story with an SME client and I blew the deal. Because yep. I, my ego wanted me to say, look what we've done. We're so cool. Look at this brand new enterprise logo of this billion dollar company that we landed. It served me. It gave me significance, but it didn't give my prospect significance. And it created a disconnection. So we need to have a human being as the relatable main character and a company who has a similar DNA to the, the person that you're trying to impact. Now, I oh... Well, before you get to O, oh, yeah. you said something very important there that I want everybody listening or watching right now to pay attention mm -hmm. to. You said this and I wrote it down. I was giving myself significance, but I wasn't giving my prospect significance. If your prospect can't relate to the story, it's not for them. They're gone. They're gone. They're out. They've checked out. It's the same reason that your your slide with a picture of your world headquarters doesn't attract as much attention as you think it does. That gives you significance. It does not give your prospect significance. And that is the aspect of relatability that I think so many people miss. It's like, well, let me tell them a story of someone who sounds like them. No, you need to tell a story of someone they feel they can be. That is what connects them to the future state that you're about to describe. That is so, so key. And I love that you said that. I think the key thing is, is the prospect needs to be in a position where they can see themselves in the pains, the desires and the transformation mm -hmm. of that main character. And when you say I helped Cisco, that doesn't do anything for anybody. But when you say no. I helped Jamie Smith, who lives in San Francisco with his three kids, who's the SVP of global sales at Cisco, that's very, very different, right? So Definitely. people connect with people, not necessarily companies, in my opinion. But then it comes to, oh, brother, and I don't know if you've got a friend like this, but I have a friend called Rich, and every time I'm meeting, man, he tells me stories which have no beginning, they have no middle, they have no <laughs> end. And 14 minutes later, I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, thank you for wasting 14 minutes of my life, bro. But O stands for organically unfolding within a simple story arc. Now, reps often know from their work on storytelling that the hero's journey is a very popular story arc. Now, the issue with that is, it's fantastic for books, in my opinion, movies, big, big, maybe theater performances or longer form content, but it's not great for when you're trying to share a 90 second story inside of a demo, right? So I believe it boils down to these four key elements within a story arc, which is context, mm -hmm. conflict, turning point, transformation. What mm -hmm. was the context where you introduce a relatable main character? What is the conflict where they experience a million dollar problem and they can't overcome it? What was the turning point where they have an aha moment and it's the beginning of the transformation? And then what's the resolution, right? How did this change when they became victorious, impact time, money, and energy for them? You know what I'm saying? So it's got to organically unfold within a simple story arc. And then R stands for revealing the villain, man.
revealing the villain. Mm. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, brother, I used to love the movie Aladdin. And my mom and dad took me to Disney World in Florida. And I remember seeing Jafar. Dude, I hated him so much. <laughs> like, I really hated him so much. And he stepped on my foot when I asked him for an autograph. And he wouldn't give it to me. I had, like, my little Mickey Mouse booklet. It was filled with autographs, right? Peter Pan, Snow White. Jafar wouldn't do it. And I was like, "That's I hate you even more now, man. And <laughs> the, best, the best thing is, is every good story has a villain. But the question is, is in the eyes of your prospect, it's not Jafar. It is the million-dollar problem, not the pain not the symptom, the underlying root cause, which is preventing them from getting to the promised land. And then it comes mm. to end, brother, really simple, but nurture trust. Meaning I can't imagine a scenario where I went up to my wife on the first date, or even when I first interacted with her and said, hey, my name is Ravi Rajani, and I want to know if you could marry me or if you will marry me, right? Should be like, Go, go away, right? <laughs> Get out of here, man. But imagine trying to ask somebody to marry you on a first date and we wouldn't in real life. So why do we think it's okay to do that in a, in a virtual scenario when we're sharing a story or even when we're trying to get people's interest on platforms like LinkedIn or whatever it might be. So you got to meet the buyer with where they are at in the buyer's mm -hmm. journey. And that requires a contextual call to action. No pitch slapping people, no pitch slapping. This is such a great framework because it does, one, it's open enough for people to make their own, which is a key part of selling, right? You can't sell like you if you're trying to follow too closely someone else's scripts or playbooks or anything like that. There's got to be room for you in the sales process, in the, in the methodology. But you gave people enough context and enough detail here to see them, to, to see themselves doing this, right? So what I love is it's so meta. Ravi, you, you're you're doing your own work here while you're explaining the work that you're doing. It's, yeah. it's really cool. And, and look, go back, listen to the last six or seven minutes of, of Ravi unfolding that acronym for you because it's all laid out here. These are the elements you have to get right. And there are a lot of ways that you can do it. So it's, it's I, I love that. That's really good. So you didn't just like you said, come out of the womb with an acorn strategy, nah. right? So what was it like early on for you? You know, I like to say that every top performer of which you're certainly one, every top performer has this moment in time when they decide that, you know, the way I was taught isn't working for me the way I think it should. And I'm stifling these instincts. I am holding on to things that I really feel to be true, but I'm just not brave enough to put into play because no one's done them before. I don't have a model of this for, for me to look at and use. I don't have an ACORN acronym you know, to, to go with here. I, I know what I'm doing. I know what needs to be done, but it's not safe. I, I, I don't know if I can make that leap. I remember where I was when I made that decision and it was a do or die decision. You know, what was that process like for you? When did you decide to sell like you? Well, you know what? As you were talking, I was like, I don't really have a complete answer for you because I don't feel like for me anyway, there was a specific moment. I would say okay. there was these micro moments, which sure. then created the stress fracture, which was like, you can ultimately have, the, I suppose the best way to put it is, put five people in a room who all have the ability to make a million dollars. Now, all of them are going to do it in their own way in accordance to what's worked for them, their experiences, their expertise, and leaning on what makes them unique. And I think growing up, when I first entered the world of work and sales, I didn't have the level of consciousness and self-awareness that I do now, but I felt like emulating my mentors was the first place that I went to. And often that worked, but there were certain parts that fell out of alignment, but it felt like, no, no, you, you know, you, you got to do this because this, this is what works for right. this person. It is that way. This is the way it is. But I think as I've gone through life, had more experiences and also have learned that my operating system as a human being skill set and gift, because I believe we all have a gift is different to somebody else's. I've started to learn that, listen, 
You can have the best talk track, you can have the best script, you can have the best product, but if people can't connect with you as a human being because you're hiding behind the mask, then you're always going to attract things, people, jobs, prospects, opportunities that are aligned with the version and the image of you that you're portraying to the world versus who you really are. Now, what I like to tell people is you can look at my framework and I've got other frameworks, for example, of how to share a simple sales story inside of a sales process. And there's different types of sales stories you can share, which I teach, for example, in my boot camp. But at the same time, you need to follow a framework, find freedom within that framework, and then break it and create your own. And that third step is beautiful. But I don't think I could have got to the third step if I hadn't followed somebody's framework first that I agree sure. with. And I think what's work, what works for me today is I like to read something and I'm better at now saying, oh, I like this. I I'm going to take this little thing. Oh, and I like this. I'm going to take this little thing. And how do I feel about this? And I think sometimes as reps, we go, oh, this is given to me. Like, I'm just going to do it versus instead of being taught what to think, being taught how to think, I think is more beneficial because it allows you to get to step three and what you really stand for as a, as a consultant, as a sales trainer and everything with the way you're helping people rethink the way that they sell. So what does it mean to sell like you? Well, in short, it means more pipeline. It means bigger deals that close faster and more often. It means more customer loyalty, so there's less churn. And it means a culture on your team where winning is expected and everyone's having fun. Now, if this sounds like something your team needs, go to jeffbajorek.com forward slash services and find out how I use this approach to help teams like yours create world-class results. Now, back to the show. You said so many things there. I wrote down one of them and the other one I didn't need to write down. I just smiled because it, it, it touched my soul, right? And the thing I wrote down was you are going to attract whatever that version of you at that time would attract. And the thing about sell like you is that it's about, it's about integrity. It's not just about modifying the language. It's not about rewriting some, you know, boilerplate templated, you know, marketing copy for your prospecting emails or your newsletter. It's about knowing who you are. It's about acting like who you are. And what's funny is, and I love, I just love the way you said it was the version of yourself that you're acting as during that time is what is going to attract those leads, those outcomes, really. Now, it leads maybe in, in terms of a sales and marketing standpoint, but the outcomes in, in, in terms of this. And then to layer that over, how do you feel when you're acting that way? And the more that you act out of alignment or out of integrity with who you really are, the more you're going to attract things that aren't in alignment with who you are. And then you're just going to continue to veer off course. And that's how people end up miserable, but making a ton of money. <laughs> like mm, it, 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 and, and you have to maintain that integrity. And, and it's funny, you know, when you, you talk about integrity in salespeople and you look at the rankings, the Gallup rankings or whoever does this, you know, this survey of, you know, what are the most and least trusted professions out there? And, you know, insurance, life insurance salespeople particularly rank right below politicians or, or right above politicians really? like at the bottom of the list. <laughs> oh, it's awful. And Todd Capone talks about this and, and others do as well, but Todd's a good friend of mine. And that's why I, I, I hear from him more often. And it's because of this perceived lack of integrity, but lack of integrity doesn't just mean I say one thing and I do another. Yeah. It means I'm really one person, but I feel like I have to act as if in order to fit in, in order to succeed. I'm just uncomfortable. I have this level of insecurity that I really feel uncomfortable with. It feels safer if I just do what Jeff or what Ravi tells me. But you know what? You use someone else's framework, you will only be at best 
mediocre. If there was a good framework out there that everybody should be using, then everybody would use it. And then by definition, we'd all be mediocre because no one would stand out and be a superstar. And it's just, it's, it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm thinking about this and telling people about this. And it's like, let's play this out to its natural successful quote, you know, end. it isn't that successful. It isn't that good. You have to show up as yourself. And it doesn't just mean authenticity. It means like, no, I am. It doesn't mean authenticity the way it's spoken about. It truly means authenticity. I'm showing up as the 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 complete version of myself. And when I show up as that, the right things, the, the when I show up in the with the right intention, the right responses, the right outcomes find me. And that keeps me there because the response is is, you know, the 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 one I'm looking for, right? So I just I know I went off on a little bit of a rant there, but like you, that's that's what that's exactly why I love these conversations, and that's that's I knew you would bring that to this because you're you've got such a great point of view. That's thank so cool. you, brother. I appreciate it, man. And look, this is not me speaking from a space of never having done that and being self righteous. Speaking from a place of being being in that shoes and feeling being that position rather and feeling out of alignment. And I think you know what it actually begins with is actually the sales leader. Because if you have a sales leader who stands up and is unapologetically self-expressed, owns who they truly are with, you know, and can speak with zero inhibitions, it gives you the permission as a rep to do the same. But yes. when the sales leader is operating in a certain way, the reps will only feel safety within certain boundaries and they'll end up suffocating who they truly are. And guess what? That's a one way ticket to disconnection and feeling like like, you know what? I can't be who I am, but maybe that's actually what sales is about. You can't be who you are. You need to be professional. And the beautiful thing is, man, people may listen to this right now and go, Ravi's not my guy. And you know what? That is totally cool. I urge you to find some other human being who you do align with. But the people who do align with the real me, the way I speak, the way I connect with people, what's great is, is when we do partner together, if we ever do, like you and I partnering together now, it's easy because the energies that we've exchanged through LinkedIn, we understand one another's energies. But if I was portraying a completely different version of me, there you may have never reached out and said, hey, should we do a podcast, right? Because you'd be like, oh, this dude ain't my guy. You know what I mean? It's, it's really interesting. You you sell a little bit of that authenticity when you try to leverage someone specifically for their network or specifically for their net worth, or, you know, I'm following this strategy. I need to follow or connect with the people who have a bazillion followers because then, you know, th that never works out. You've been doing podcasts for a while. I've been doing podcasts for years. And the people who showed up that where it's like, okay, I'd like to leverage your network. And I say, oh, you have a lot of followers. You know, you, okay, sure. Let's, let's kind of do it. It never works out. It never really? works out. In what way? Oh. Like, have you just found that they, you can't, you can't actually connect with who they are beyond the online persona or what would you mean? They're my least favorite conversations to have. Really? Okay. So in real time, it's like, we didn't connect under the best of circumstances. Right. And, and, and so for a while, when Christy and I had the why and the buy, we stopped taking, um, we stopped taking calls from PR agencies and, and things like that, unless we knew that there were a couple of times where someone just had PR and I'm like, oh, I didn't know Joe had a PR campaign working for, I know Joe. And then I respond and say, next time, just tell Joe to send me a text. I don't know why he's paying you to do this. Right. But so when it was that kind of a situation, there was something organically, authentically brought us together. Those conversations went great. And some of our best episodes went and, and occurred with, for, with people who didn't have very big audiences at all because we were connecting and discussing things for the right reasons. But then there were others where, okay, big following, I'm on the PR campaign, I'm doing the junket, I'm going from show to show to show to show to show. Oftentimes they don't promote. It's just, you know, you're, it's a gift that they're appearing on your podcast. And the, my audience, my network, my listeners didn't resonate with it at all because right. it was canned. It wasn't in the moment. There wasn't a whole lot of feeling behind it. It was just empty messaging. And um, that I think is, I, I don't know if you're seeing this, Ravi, you're certainly speaking as if you're seeing this, but there is a movement in the sales world right now toward this concept, toward I'm not going to take any shit because I'm better than that, toward, you know, 
there, there need to be non-monetary benefits, you know, to working for this company toward, you know, if I don't feel good about what I'm selling, whether it's because, you know, I have, I want to make an environmental impact or I have some cause that I want to support, or there's a charitable, you know, force behind what I do. Like there, there's, there's more and more alignment between who people are and what they sell. And there's even more than that. There is more of a movement toward having that alignment. And I've really recognized that recently. And I think that's why this is, this is so resonant. I think it's cool, man. And it, it it really boils down to something that you said, which resonated with me about, I don't know if it's on your LinkedIn, you said it or somewhere, but it's about the different sales methodologies that are out there. I think they all have their own merit in some way, but if mm-hmm. you try and put everybody in the same bucket, prospects and the human beings that are selling your products, it's not going to fit like a glove every single time. So it's about having the consciousness and awareness to know, okay, this works for us in our environment. And by the way, this is coming from an, ex- this is coming from experience of like, okay, we need to have this methodology because this is, this is good, right? This is, this right. is the one that we need to go for, but actually mm, this isn't fit. So we need to tweak this, tweak that, you know, but I think if we boil it down to fundamentals, Mm-hmm. And really go back to what you said about alignment. I do see that movement. And I think if somebody is misaligned with a company's product, a company themselves, and also the leader that they're going to be partnering with, that that's a they're not going to last very, very long. Versus, mm-hmm. versus I think before that, many, many years ago, especially in the world of investment banking, it was we're paying you enough money, shut up. Right. It was like, it's like, we're paying you like that. That's the trade-off, right? You take mm-hmm. a lot of rubbish because the paycheck is higher than the average graduate at the time. And that was kind of like the mindset, which if I look back, it, and this is not specific to the bank that I work. This is, this is like, if you look at law firms, you look at banks, you look at big professional services companies, there is often this mindset. And I think people are getting smart, man. They're like, yeah, no, nah, that's not, that's not a good fit for me now. And they're really getting a lot more aware around alignment, which I love. Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny when you take that job for the money. Okay. And it doesn't align with you. You're selling your integrity. How much are you selling it for? How much should it be worth? Yeah. And, and, and why'd you give them such a big discount? Yeah, huge, <laughs> right. <huge discount. laughs> that is, that is the problem. That's huge. Ravi, this has been a blast. This has been a blast. Thanks for for being here. What tell tell the people where they can find you. Tell the people where they can find your boot camp. And I'm just guessing you have an Acorn strategy download somewhere that I can share with them. Uh, well, I tell you what I do have is I do have a elevator story script download, a download, a download, which is a 45 second script on ultimately how to craft an elevator story that really connects with your prospects. So there you go. Ha, huh. they tilt their head, they go, ha, huh. tell me more. So yeah. the best place to get access to that is DM me on LinkedIn, add me at Ravi Rajani, but then DM me with the word elevator and I'll send it directly to you. Awesome, awesome. We'll have the link to your profile in the show notes here. You're not hard to find on LinkedIn. I don't know what it was, but I don't know, six weeks ago, I yeah. saw you everywhere. I had never really? seen you before. And then really? all of a sudden it was like, who is this good looking guy who is on every video <laughs> and every place speaking with like enthusiasm and just, like, I'm like, this is, this guy's onto something here. So you appeared magically before me. Maybe it was because maybe it was just that, that attraction about this integrity. We realized that there are people on the same journey trying to do the same work for the the sales community. And, and it was just time. I don't know. I'm not, it's funny. Like on a scale of one to two woos, you know, if you have no woos, woo or woo woo, I'm like a one woo guy, right? Like I, I, I won't argue with anything that works, but maybe, maybe the universe just put us together, Ravi. I don't know. I think so, brother. I'm a big believer in that, that everything happens for a reason. I'm a big believer in that the whole concept of the universe so i'm glad that we're connected now man and look forward to deepening that relationship over over on linkedin because i know you're putting out a lot of content and when, mm-hmm. this show this this show goes out in when december right yeah this episode yep. mm-hmm. this episode right exactly so yeah man when people are listening to this it'll be 2023 or just ending 2022 so get that year started the right way and i believe it's through storytelling people but hey i'm biased uh, that, that's okay it's a good bias yeah. Thanks for having me. Cheers, brother. <laughs> 
If I had one word to describe Ravi, it is moxie. And I think that came through in the interview. And I'm sure you heard it. And if you haven't seen it, go to YouTube, check it out. This guy just owns it. Everything about him. He's liquid swagger, this guy is. And I've just really appreciated getting to know him a little bit better. I'm going to be on his podcast very soon. And uh, it's just, I've had a ball really connecting with him. Do yourself a favor. Go to the website. The link is in the show notes. Download that simple Acorn storytelling framework. He lays it all out there for you. Even if you're really good at telling stories, even if you are good at helping people understand what it is that you do, this is a perspective that will help you see it from a different different angle, and I promise you'll take something away from it. I certainly did. Thank you, as always, for hanging with me. Um, I I hope you're enjoying these uh, episodes. I've brought you a handful of interviews so far, bringing people on to tell their own stories, tell their own origin stories, tell their own, you know, journeys of what it meant when they finally decided that they were the ones in charge of deciding how they were going to sell. I hope you're learning about your own journey from the journey of others. If this is something that you think is worthwhile, please share it with someone. And uh, look, I'm, I'm rebuilding this community at Rethink the Way You Sell dot com. It kind of went dormant for a little bit. I needed to figure out what I wanted to do with the Mighty Networks platform that I'm on, but I have courses there. There are people there. I'm in it every day, and it's a great way to really just explore my content, explore the content of some other people, and really learn what it is that you want to do with your sales career, because at the end of the day, your opinion is the only one that matters, and that is the one that will help you do your very best work. I'm going to dig into storytelling next week on my own. Can't wait to be with you then, and I'll talk to you soon. Rethink the Way You Sell is a Pot About It production. It's mixed and edited by Doug Branson with music by Blue Dot Sessions and Doug Branson. This podcast is masterminded by Jeff Bajorek.